Hi all, welcome to this series of lectures in psychology. In this session, we shall be discussing at length the topic, one of the topic that, that excites, that engages many psychologists, that's, that's intriguing, that's exciting, that's, that's really captivating with so many points of view, so many theories, so many thought leaders into it, which is personality, right? So we, we will dig deeper, we will dive deeper to understand all those points of view of some of the celebrated psychologists and their views, their theories, their contributions in an effort to understand how the personality of an individual can be can be observed, can be studied, can be understood, can be interpreted and can draw some inferences about the personality of a human being. Okay, there we go. Like, like any concept, any chapter, we begin with understanding, with the definition, which, which stands as the most fundamental approach to understand the concept. So, as, as the image suggests, uh, personality broadly comprises these three components to understand, to study in an individual, namely the thoughts, the feelings, and uh, the behaviors, right? So put together, uh, personality can be defined as a set of unique and relatively stable patterns of thought, emotions, and behavior that define an individual. So as, as the definition suggests, how you think, how you speak, how you, how you uh, uh, demonstrate yourself, and how you behave, um, is, is what is about uh, your personality. In other words, personality is a sum of person's physical, psychological, emotional and social aspects which are manifested or which are put together, which are totaled up, which are demonstrated, which are there to be seen through the behavior and actions of that individual. So that's, that's how, uh, in a nutshell, personality can be understood and uh, what makes us ourself the unique combination of uh, all those factors which we had just uh, called out here the physical self the color the height the appearance the uh, the nativity all those comprise your, your the gender the age group that you belong to, the society that you belong to, the economic strata that you belong to, the geography you belong to, culture you belong to, all these contribute to your psychological being, your physical being, emotional, and the social aspects that you represent. And all these put together contribute significantly, substantially, to the making of your personality, which is why we say it's a sum of person's physical, psychological, emotional and social aspects which are manifested through behavior and actions. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the basic definition of personality, but that there's a lot more to understand into personality. We take a deep dive into the thought processes of those celebrated psychologists who offered to us many um, interesting, many exciting uh, viewpoints, theories, which became theories to understand the concept of psychology in greater depth. Okay, there we go. So it was Gordon Alport, we can, we can, we can attribute uh, Gordon Alport the credit to initiate, to begin the very first thinking around uh, personality. So what he did, uh, he, he just jotted down through a brainstorming, an intense brainstorming session with his colleagues, he just jotted down all those possible words that uh, uh, that, that, that directly or indirectly, closely or remotely uh, they, are, they can be related to uh, the word personality. So when they did the exercise, the list of words that in some or the other way can be related to or can, are adjacent to the word personality, the list came down to about 18,000 words. So that formed the first basis the first 
uh, ever uh, a basis of uh, piece of research, work of research to take the study further in, in a further understanding of the word uh, personality. So in, in, uh, it was in, in that era that Gordon Allport identified thousands of personality traits or uh, the words that he made a, a mini dictionary of, of the words related to personality which became precisely to around 18,000 words which he grouped into three categories. What are those three categories? The three categories can be named as cardinal traits. The cardinal traits are those very, very basic fundamental core traits of an individual which largely remain uh, unique and very few in number and the change in these traits means the change in personality. Such core, such fundamental, such basic. And then the central traits which are not as fundamental, as basic as root level but they are also important traits of an individual secondary traits which are like as the name suggests secondary they're not basic but they are like superficial uh, traits which uh, which are likely to be found among many people at a given point of time so cardinal traits some of the examples that you can look at are really some of the very very uh, uh, hand-picked uh, very specific and not so common uh, rare kind of traits which vary from individual to individual like perfectionism is very clearly a cardinal trait emotional stability is a cardinal trait likewise independence altruism and extroversion right so those are some of the very core basic traits which are not very commonly available likewise if you look at uh, the central traits loyal kind agreeable these are uh, relatively more common than cardinal, less common than secondary traits, friendly, approachable, whereas secondary traits are, are, are they are uh, uh, the, the words or the traits which may not be of great significance to, to explain the personality of an individual. Whereas if you look at the cardinal traits, they are extremely uh, indicative they are explaining, they are describing, they are defining the personality. You can say, okay, this guy is like this, or, or this girl is of, is of this kind of personality, right? Emotional stability, independence, altruism, very powerful, very uh, uh, effective, impact-making, sensitive traits, whereas loyal, kind, agreeable are also, but not as cardinal, as core as cardinal traits. Secondary traits might be, find more, might be found more commonly across individuals may not be enough, may not be sufficient to explain the behavior, explain the personality of an individual like shyness, anxiety, irritability, impatience, nervousness. So that was the very first work ever done by uh, an expert, a subject matter expert, which paved way into uh, the future work, into the, the, the uh, topic of psychology, uh, to understand the the concept of personality. So that's uh, that's uh, that was about Alport's uh, work in personality. Um, that takes us to to the next. Okay, before which uh, before which we can uh, answer the questions and then uh, we can move into the next portion of uh, personality. Okay, there we go. The next effort, uh, the next thought leader who contributed uh, to understand the, the concept of personality further was Ray Cattell, who identified uh, like, uh, um, like, like Gordon Alport had uh, uh, identified so many traits which he broadly segregated into three categories. Ray Cattell had uh, identified 16 such factors which he thought uh, explain the personality of uh, an individual um, and the factors are as you see on uh, the screen warmth so uh, intellect emotional stability aggressiveness liveliness dutifulness social assertiveness sensitivity paranoia what do you mean by paranoia paranoia is a tendency of fearing uh, constant fear 
of people, of situations, of, of, of places, when you are afraid constantly for no rational, uh, uh, reasonable uh, uh, reason um, and, uh, uh, and you're st you're, you're, the, the fear haunts you, That's, that, that suggests that an individual is in a state of paranoia or the individual is paranoid, right? Likewise, abstractness, introversion, anxiety, open-mindedness, independence, perfectionism, tension. So those 16, uh, Ray Cattle was of the view that if a, an individual is given to take the test of personality comprising these 16 factors, you can give a very elaborate uh, uh, opinion, give a uh, an elaborate and a reliable explanation about the tendencies of the individual's personality. Okay, so uh, he had an instrument which said that if you, if someone attains a low score on the factor called warmth, uh, then he can be named as cold and selfish, whereas high score would suggest the individual is supportive and comforting. Likewise, if you take abstractly, randomly, another, um, say, low score against aggressiveness. What do you mean by when, when you say when, when, when someone attains a low score, score on the factor called aggressiveness, the individual can be explained person as a personality who who has who is modest and docile, not very aggressive, not very active, not very um, uh, volunteering, right? Whereas a high score would mean uh, probably the person is controlling by nature, tough by nature, hardy by nature. Likewise, um, you can see that each factor has a corresponding explanation of how how you can explain the personality of an individual depending upon the score of the individual against that factor. So that was Ray Kettle's um, 16 factors theory of personality. Okay, that's followed by Isenck's personality factors. Isenck had, as you can see uh, uh, in the image on the left, um, the uh, he created um, uh, uh, so theory of personality by Isaac is based essentially on two broad factors that is emotional stability and the extroversion. So if you can see on the x-axis the extroversion on one extreme it's called extroverted personality and on the other extreme this the individual an individual can be called introverted personality. Likewise if you look at the y-axis on the top the person uh, is labeled as emotionally unstable. In other words, neurotic and rock bottom when you see same axis, you find emotionally stable tendency of an individual. And if you look at the whole lot of attributes, whole lot of traits, whole lot of adjectives that you see around the circle, they are um, suggesting a combination of each of the two traits on the X and the Y axis. If you look at the top of x y axis a combination of adjectives a, a combination of traits an individual is expected to reflect when it is a combination of top of y axis and right of x axis that is emotionally unstable and extroverted when somebody is in the zone of emotionally unstable emotional instability and extroversion the person can be can be uh, is, is likely to be touchy Restless, aggressive, excitable, changeable, impulsive, optimistic, active. And the combination of all these, um, uh, and the person is, is likely to be bad tempered because he's extroverted or irritable, right? So, a combination of all these have been uh, called as choleric by Isaac. Choleric, which would be somewhat in the in the sense of a bad-tempered or irritable guy who's extroverted, who can express, but is emotionally not very stable. Now, if you look at the uh, traits, which is a combination of the bottom of y-axis and the right of x-axis, that is extroverted and emotionally stable. What can you expect from a person who is extroverted and emotionally stable? The, the set of words that you see there, sociable, outgoing, talkative, responsive, easygoing, lively, carefree, leadership. Someone who, who is likely to demonstrate very effective leadership. 
So uh, um, one word that Isaac had attributed to the combination of all these uh, a combination of extroverted and emotionally stable is sanguine, which would which would tr uh, uh, transliterate synonym, which is synonymous to being optimistic, being positive. Likewise, if you look at the third quadrant, which is a combination of the left of x axis and the bottom of y, that is introverted and emotionally stable, a person is likely to be passive, careful, thoughtful, peaceful, controlled, reliable, even tempered, and calm. And one word that I think attributes to these set of words is phlegmatic, which would, in other words, means unemotional, stoic, calm, balanced, balanced disposition. Yep. Likewise, the last quadrant, which is a combination of the top of y-axis and the left of x-axis, that is emotional instability and introverted. How can you describe this person? He or she could be found moody, anxious, rigid, sober, pessimistic, reserved, unsociable, quiet. And one word that I think attributes to all these is melancholic. <coughs> Melancholy, sad, dejected, depressed, um, or despondent, but not expressive because the individual is, is introverted. So that's how uh, Isaac looks at uh, personality of an individual which can be broadly classified owing to various attributes, various traits, broadly based on emotional stability and the extroversion tendency of the individual classifies uh, personality into its four types, melancholic, choleric, sanguine and phlegmatic, which are very categorically placed on the four quadrants of the four axes, that is X and Y left right bottom and top okay so i think that that was pretty clear as i think's personality factors and there comes in one of the most popular again uh, celebrated models of uh, personality wherein goldberg would identify a personality with five attributes so you 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 need to remember the number of factors that cattle 16 are uh, Alports, uh, the thousands of attributes which are segregated into into three broad categories, and as you saw, Isaac's four quadrants and Goldberg's big five. Right, as you see, the number is drilling down from thousands to hundreds to tens to now you have the number in units. Goldberg's, which is also popularly referred to as big five theory of personality, big five because he boil down all those factors of personality into five big factors which uh, which as a mnemonic which can be remembered as ocean ocean it's it's an acronym that stand for those five uh, five attributes or five traits that uh, goldberg uh, explains goldberg proposes to explain his theory of personality O stands for openness to experience, someone who is open to experience, someone who is open to, uh, to experimenting, to listen, to, to experience, right? And followed by conscientiousness. What would that mean? Conscience, conscience is, uh, is the measure of one's own moral compass. Conscience, how strong, the stronger is your conscience, the stronger, the clearer is your moral compass you are an individual is expected to stay in strict adherence to the should what he should supposed to do he or she is is is, is, uh, uh, is supposed to do is 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 expected to do in adherence to the rules the procedures should is drives him more than will or can or must right conscience followed by extroversion extroversion as as uh, uh, you may have heard extroversion where individual is found to be more uh, of a reaching out to people kind than reserving it to oneself someone who is more reaching out more sociable more more uh, uh, connecting collaborative more um, uh, mingling with people as he or she finds uh, people around him as a source of his uh, or her energy or engagement rather than finding it within oneself right 
Likewise, agreeability, agreeability, tendency to agree to the other person rather than disapproving, rejecting, refusing or disagreeing. A general tendency to agree first and then making a critical appraisal. When it is high, it's, uh, it's, it's a desirable quality to, um, to avoid conflicts or to avoid uh, uh, contradictions or to avoid, um, you know, uh, a rift among among people agreeability is, is a great factor likewise neuroticism neuroticism is the opposite of emotional stability when someone is neurotic the individual is emotionally unstable or when someone is emotionally stable they are less on neurotic so those five are Goldberg's five of uh, to explain his, his personality theory uh, which are popularly as we said uh, also referred to as big five theory of personality okay before moving to the next portion answer the questions on the screen okay that that takes us to uh, the next uh, uh, theory of personality MMPI uh, which uh, is a which is more MMPI is essentially the primary objective of designing MMPI was uh, was actually to uh, diagnose or deal with or treat the people with uh, uh, mental conditions, mental uh, disorders, uh, which which might uh, require uh, an attention. Like you can see, there are several scales that uh, are. Uh, that are designed uh, under the, uh, the theory of, of MMPI. Uh, you, you can see uh, MMPI, which, which essentially stands for Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which is, which is a standardized psychological test that, that assesses the personality traits uh, with, with specific emphasis on pathology psychopathology in adults it is not advisable an instrument for uh, people under normal conditions but people but the but the uh, 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 the individual suffering from certain mental conditions or psychological conditions like hypochondriasis depression hysteria as you see so these are certain scales which were designed to diagnose detect whether the individuals are normal or are they demonstrating any uh, of these uh, psychological conditions and if yes then uh, the pathological intervention that may be required the treatment that may be required is thereafter um, determined so that that's about MMPI um, okay here comes in uh, one of the most respected, most revered, most celebrated, most favorite of all the psychologists. I did not even care to give the name of the psychologist on the screen, assuming that by the image you may have guessed as to who this, this uh, gentleman is. Uh, he is considered uh, the, the, the father of this branch of psychology called psychoanalysis and he is none other than uh, Sigmund, yes, Freud, Sigmund Freud, whose, whose breakthrough research to understand psychology is still referred to as one of the best theories of personality and, and he, his approach to understand the personality was, was less of theoretical and more of practical. Most of his derivations, most of his inferences in the, uh, which became theories of, of psychoanalysis which became interesting studies in psychoanalysis, they come from his, his interventions, his interactions with his own patients whom he used to have deep and long conversations with wherein he would leave them with an open-ended question and then he would allow them to talk, to talk for long hours and then he used to draw interpretations from the words they used, the kind of sentences they, they struck, they, they uh, they would uh, construct to explain their condition and he would call this approach as a approach of free flow where he would allow them 
with a open ended question to talk and then he could draw interpretations so as a result of a series of such intervention he could derive he could conclude that personality of an individual any individual across the age groups across whoever a human being's personality can be very well understood by breaking it down into broadly three components as you see here sigmund freud suggested that all of us comprise three basic personality components namely id id and then ego and then super ego how would you understand each of these as it suggests id is he would he would draw an analogy between id and a child you know a a a a restless child in us which is instinctive which is very primitive which is not quite mature in coed it's uh, and it is and which is basically it is thriving on the pleasure principle you want something and you want it now you cannot bear uh, tolerate delay or you do not have much of a reasoning going into it you don't have much of a thinking going into it you don't have much of maturity going into your demand you make a demand and you want to satisfy yourself right now right here that's one component of uh, uh, anyone's personality which is referred to as id whereas ego is uh, a component which which does uh, some amount of thinking uh, reasoning logical rationalizing uh, the demands of id right it looks around it it evaluates it uh, uh, draws uh, logical observations and then it uh, uh basis its decision it uh, evaluates whether its demands are rational or are uh, uh, so they are fundamentally they are based on the reality principle while its behavior is more based on the pleasure principle ego's um, uh, stand is based more on the reality principle the final one super ego which is like a um which is like you know a moral compass of the individual which does which evaluates the sense of right and wrong wise and unwise wise and virtue do's and don'ts rules and the violations all these are offered by the super ego component of the individual um, and and uh, so super ego finally is expected to guide the ego and uh, with its due evaluation whether or not to entertain its demands so that's that's how he breaks down so while it is based on the pleasure principle ego is based on reality principle and super ego is based on the morality principle so it is a reality and morality put together which should guide the behavior of an individual rather than allowing id to dominate the reality and morality and guide an individual into a an undesirable direction with undesirable consequences right so that's that's uh, uh what has been suggested by sigmund freud uh, in his theory of id ego and super ego okay so in addition to the three broad breakdown of components into uh, breakdown of personality into three components freud also suggested that individuals have their own way of have their own way of uh, coping with situations you know we we get into situations and we cope we need to cope with the situation because we need to get back we need to bounce back to normal condition you know all of us have situations in life we have situations of failure rejection denial or uh, 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 a lack of uh, lack of access or not lack of failing to satiate satisfy things so all these put us into or or the situations of pain situations of trauma or our experiences in early life adverse experiences all these are the experiences that push us into a, an adverse situation but then we are smart enough our mind our brain is smart enough to uh, push us back to to make a comeback to bounce back to normal uh, normal situation and freud suggested that we have our own ways of defending 
ourselves from this adverse situation in the process of coming back to bouncing back to normalcy and and Freud explains as to how what are those various methods or various approaches that we adopt to defend ourselves through these adverse conditions and these are what you see on the screen are some of those mechanisms which help us in bouncing back like the first one that you see is repression repression in psychology refers to the unconscious mechanism in which mind prevents certain thoughts memories or feelings there may be some such incidents childhood incidents early life incidents adolescent incidents which you just don't want to recall you just want to keep it in in your unconscious right you repress it you hide it you suppress you don't want that to uh, to it could be an accident or it could be an abuse or it could be a, a, a denial or it could be a humiliation that may have occurred um, and, and these are the things that, that definitely we would not want to recall at any uh, point in future of our life and hence we, we uh, apply the mechanism of repression we repress it we just want to keep it somewhere in the, in the cold storage down the, uh, the brain's corners we don't want to open that window at all repression right likewise projection what is projection projection is when we uh, we, we uh, don't want to um, uh, own up uh, the mistakes on ourselves say for instance uh, you, you may get less scores in the exam and uh, instead of so when someone asks us to why this low score our defensive mechanism most of us would attribute to most of us would use is you know question paper was tough or the teacher didn't teach it so well or my luck was bad or except your inability or your lack of preparation you would find every other factor as responsible for the uh, underperformance for your underperformance in the exam you, are, you, are, you have a tendency, this is a defensive mechanism we use, tendency to project something else or someone else responsible for your condition, right? That's, that's projection. Likewise, rationalization. Rationalization is when, when you, are, you are packaging the adversity with a possible explanation that may not hold good, but that would give you some temporary momentary comfort or solace so for instance you lose a match you lose a, a, a competition or a match and uh, someone asks or when you have to explain to yourself why could you not win your um, your your explanation your rationalization you would try to rationalize your your failure or your defeat to external conditions right that is the, the pitch was uh, not favorable or, uh, or, or the climate was not favorable or we didn't have enough practice etc. That would give you some explanation which will keep you away from the, the radar, the target, right? You are finding comfort in rationalizing it, giving it some meaning without blaming yourself. You would blame it uh, on conditions around. Okay, reaction formation. What do you mean by reaction formation? Reaction formation is when you are forming reactions on people. Example, as you see here, treating someone you strongly dislike in an excessively friendly manner because you want to avoid um, the adversity or avoid the outburst of friction or the fight the, with, with the person. So, though you dislike the person, you tend to behave, you pretend as if you don't have any dislike so you are you are forming a reaction which is untrue which is not true which is not the real but then you know that forming this reaction will prevent you from getting into a situation so we adopt a, a reaction and we form it and we pretend as if that's the real reaction so those are some of the defense mechanism refresh repression projection rationalization reaction formation there are a couple of more like intellectualization is uh, is one way 
intellectualization is when when you are trying to be a problem solver rather than cribbing around the problem okay an individual has been diagnosed with uh, some disorder some physiological disorder or some medical disorder instead of cribbing instead of pushing oneself into into a state of mind a depressive state of mind what better can be done what what next what am i supposed to do to alleviate this to reduce this problem to at least if i cannot kill the problem i can at least reduce the size of the problem so they carry a very optimistic state of mind and they apply their intellect in terms of solving the problem rather than uh, sitting cribbing and and uh, uh, killing oneself mentally emotionally right followed by denial outright denial you know the you you just don't want to agree or accept the the reality uh, that exists you know say for instance you are you're working with uh, an organization which is not doing good financially and there could be possibility of being fired the best thing is you just blindfold yourself of the reality and you just keep doing your work you don't even get into the situate get into the facts and details of what the company is going through your job is to deliver your your uh, your task your your work that's it and you don't you don't agree you don't accept you don't even want to face any of those or for instance the example that shared here <coughs> excuse me is uh, the classic example could be in fact the alcoholics who is uh, who will simply de- deny that uh, uh, that they, they are alcoholic right they don't they, the alcoholics will never agree will never accept that they they have turned they have become addicts or they have become uh, um, um, chronic uh, alcoholics and they have a problem with drinking they just deny it so denying sometimes comes for uh, a rescue as a defense mechanism likewise displacement this is a classical a classic observation you would say when i'm off in, in the office when boss shouts at an individual the individual needs a vent needs an opening to flush the the this the frustration out so when she or he is home he or she would flush out the same frustration on the people around him or her right uh, it could be spouse it could be kids or it could be watchman or it could be anyone at at home could be um, the 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 target the prey for what she has had at the office so that's like displacing your source of frustration from the source to another person okay so those were a few uh, defense mechanisms that that individuals would resort to uh, in order to comfort themselves in order to solace themselves in order to cause uh, some a uh, peace of mind to themselves okay that takes us to the next part of the assignment answer the questions before we go to the next portion of the video okay so while those were various theories of personality um, there have been numerous uh, tests instruments scales that have uh, uh, that have uh, shaped out that that have that have come into um, existence that have been inducted by the uh, APA American uh, Psychological Association uh, and and these two are some of those very early very primitive tests which uh, have uh, play which play a significant role in uh, assessing the first level personality uh, uh, of of an individual so the first one that you see is a rorschach test which is a very simple test which is conducted by pouring a few drops of ink on a white paper and then the folding the paper um, horizontally into two uh, by at and at the middle of the paper and then creating a symmetric uh, visual of the ink that it will form on either sides of the page as you see on on the image and then what you see what you figure out in the image is uh, the test for the test takers when someone might see a butterfly someone might see a devil someone might see a a an army uh, jet fighter or someone might see 
something else, right? It is, it is quite likely that uh, everyone sees the same thing and what you see is the, the content for evaluation, for analysis, for conclusions to be drawn by the experts. What you see suggests what you are, right? That's, that's about Rorschach test. And then there's something called TAT, thematic apperception test, in case uh, any one of you has gone through this um, uh, selection process for the selection of officers in, in Indian Defense Services uh, through the NDA National Defense Academy selection or Combined Defense Services selection. If you have acquaintances in your family, you can actually, you can actually uh, you know, ask as to how, what were the initial tests that they were put to while they were undergoing the five-day selection process at the Services Selection Board. One of the very, uh, very prominent tests that the cadets, uh, as they are called, the cadets are put to is these uh, ambiguous stimuli that you see about 20 images which are put one after the other uh, and then the candidates the cadets are asked to write a quick short five line six line story that they can uh, figure out from the image that they see right and that tells uh, quite a bit about the thought process the the inclinations the tendencies of the personality of an individual. So those, those were projective tests put together. They're called projective tests because you project a stimulus, an ambiguous stimulus, and then you draw, uh, you ask, you collect the responses, and then you, you make interpretations of their responses based on which you draw the conclusions about the personality tendencies of, of the individuals. So they are referred to as projective tests. Okay. The behaviorist approach uh, comprises these three popular uh, theories that define the personality, the tendencies, the learning tendencies of individuals, classical conditioning, wherein uh, the, which, is, which, is, which comprises the experiments with the dog and how the dog is conditioned, um, essentially driven by Ivan Pavlov, operant conditioning, which is with the mouse and, uh, um, and uh, various meaningful conclusions drawn. Social learning theory by Albert Bandura, wherein kids are exposed to various types of, of, of movies and then are given a bunch of toys. So all these, why I'm running a little fast is because we have had a very elaborate discussion around, around, around all these three theories of uh, conditioning uh, in the chapter learning. So for elaborate understanding of these three, you may refer to the chapter learning uh, in the series of lectures in psychology. Okay, then it's uh, so after after a psychoanalytic approach, you had uh, uh, you, you had cattles, and then you had uh, uh, cognitive. So now we have we have, we get into the, we had projective tests, and then we get into the cognitive approach. Uh, we had behavioral approach, and then cognitive approach by Walter Michel, where he identified cognitive variables which define, which explain, uh, which contribute to the personality of an individual. According to Walter Michel, the various cognitive variables that contribute to the making of personality can be identified as those uh, uh, five that you see, competencies, encoding strategies, expectancies, subjective values, and self-regulatory systems of individuals. Competencies would comprise the, the, the individual capabilities like intellectual abilities, social skills, physical skills. Encoding strategies is how I am interpreting whatever stimulus I am exposed to from my surroundings, right? It could be human, it could be objects, it could be, it could be speeches, it could be, uh, 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 it could be any content that I am exposed to in my, or it could be experiences in society. In, in, the, in, in the classrooms, in lectures, how am I encoding? So my encoding instruments um, of, for an individual are what you see on the right hand side corresponding perceptions, how I perceive, how I interpret and how my thought process is thus uh, shaped and, and it uh, runs through. So encoding strategies differ, they vary from individual to individual and that contributes to the uniqueness of your personality. 
Likewise, expectancies. Why do I come to college? Because I need to pursue my, my degree, finish my degree. Why do you need to uh, finish your degree? Because I want to go for the, for the further studies. Why do you want to go for further studies? Because I want to do my master's or doctorate. Why do you want to do that? Because I want to make a good career. Why do you want to make a good career? Because I want to make, I want to make a mark of myself. I want to contribute something substantial. Or I want to make money. Or I want to take care of my family. Right? So each of your subsequent action has certain expectancy and the expectancy is what guides your behavior. It reasons your behavior and it prompts you to take certain reliable, clear, rational decisions in life. So expectancies according to Walter Michel is uh, one of the very important components of uh, uh, variables of personality. <clears throat> Likewise, subjective values. What do you mean values? Those fundamental virtues of an individual that guide your behavior, your worth, your personal values like kindness, truthfulness, conscientiousness, or uh, sincerity, humbleness, modesty, hardworking, hardy. These are all your the, the, some of the values that you, that can be owned up, right? Virtues, conscience, wisdom, etc. So subjective values contribute a lot to the making of personality of an individual. Likewise, self-regulatory. So, so once you have all these formed very clearly, your competencies and coding strategies, expectancies and subjective values, now you have your instruments, your tools, your levers to regulate your behavior. So you, you form your goals, your plans, rules, standards and, and discipline and then you drive your behavior with the help of all those four crucial components that we the variables, cognitive variables that we discussed just above. So that's that defines, that evaluates, uh, that explains cognitive approach by Walter and Michel. Continuing cognitive approach, Kelly had a, a, another take on understanding the personality. Kelly was not of the view that a personal a personality can be understood with the help of some predetermined uh, set of variables suggested by an expert. Like you had psychoanalytic, the three components, Kelly's, uh, no, sorry, uh, cattle, 16 constructs, or big fives, uh, five. Uh, likewise, so Kelly was of the view, uh, George Kelly was of the view that it is tough to confine uh, a theory to certain, certain constructs or certain competencies and, uh, uh, and, and evaluate someone's personality. Uh, it, it is and because he was of the view that individuals themselves are intuitive scientists you cannot capture their personality confine it or limit it to those five or six or ten or sixteen constructs that you have identified as the constructs of personality individuals he was of the view that individuals discover personal their own personal constructs they observe they formulate they test they theorize they categorize, they interpret, and they judge. So it is, again, he was of the view that it is challenging. It, it may not be very, very reliable to identify an individual's personality based on predetermined, pre-templatized uh, set of constructs. And finally, he was of the view that each individual has a unique personal constructs. So it's tough to uh, define uh, or explain personality based on a templatized for a um, set of constructs. Uh, but then uh, uh, measuring the personality in some of the other contexts is essential. So the personality uh, frameworks and the instruments are still popular as a means of measuring the personalities of, of individual for various purposes. Okay, before we move in to the next portion, answer the question. Okay. So that takes us to the, a, a concept, a, a deep and a, a very thought-provoking concept called cognitive schema. What do you mean by schema? Schema is, is, is a, a mental structure that each one of us forms when we are exposed to a certain scenario. It's a cognitive structure which is formed by, it's a screen, it's a cognitive screen that you and I, each one, everyone, when you are exposed to a certain scenario, but say for instance, when you're exposed to this lecture, as you're listening to the lecture, every one of you, each one of you has, has developed a, a unique 
cognitive schema, a, 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 a schematic structure on your mind. Some of you may be, uh, you know, uh, you, you may be forming a very elaborate understanding of personality already, and uh, uh, some of you may be stuck in the conflict of of uh, which personality is the best, or some of you may be making a very comprehensive view of all the personality theories put together, or some of you may be having your own questions, your own doubts about uh, what amounts to a personality. So each one of us is forming our own uh, schema, a cognitive schema, a cognitive screen, a mental framework when uh, you are exposed to certain scenario, and that mental framework which is loaded with your understanding, your experience, your thinking, your rationalizing, your questioning, your evaluating, uh, your describing, your interpretation is what is referred to as a cognitive uh, schema. As, as you read here, cognitive schema is like a cognitive framework that organizes information about the world around you, around us. It's a packet of information in our brain that categorizes objects into groups. So what, what could those groups be? As you see, groups could be object schema, when you are actually observing the objects around you, like, like the cars, the buses, the, the, the benches, the desks, the lights. Role schema, the, what is the role that you are playing in various spaces that you belong to? In a given day, you could be put your, putting yourself into several roles. You are playing the role of, of a student, of a mentee, of a son, of a social citizen, of a, of a brother, of a cousin, of a friend, right? Various roles that you're playing and each role is offering you a unique schema to, to evaluate, to assess yourself. Likewise, event schema. Differentiating between any two events, event, event again, you're surrounded by several events. <coughs> Excuse me, event could be an exam event, even a, a, a lecture event, a fest event, or uh, a, a travel by bus event, several events that you come through on any given day put you, offer you several schemas, each uh, one schema from each of those events to, to assess as to how you've come through. Likewise, self schema, learning about your own personality, your own aptitudes, your capabilities, your limitations, your strengths, your, uh, um, the, 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 the advantages that you carry and the limitations that you carry. Likewise, person schema, learning about others' personalities, roles, and preferences, the people that you're surrounded by, your friends, your colleagues, your classmates, your, your teachers, your parents, your neighbors, your uncles, aunts, professors, your, all the people that you're surrounded by, each of those can, offers you certain unique schema for you to assess, evaluate, and arrive at uh, uh, certain conclusions. So what comes of use is to get conscious of the cognitive schema that your mind wants to entertain, wants to evaluate and that gives you a very clear perspective of what you are going through, where you belong and how clear is your decision in regard to that particular schema. Okay. That's uh, the humanistic approach. Um, uh, which, which uh, is based on these four uh, principles, namely the subjective views, self-perceptions and experiences, which is based on the fundamental question, who am I? There could be a lot of psychological, a lot of philosophical uh, derivations as a response to this question, followed by human choice, which is based on the creativity, self-actualization. What do you mean self-actualization? Um, that is developing uh, the capabilities to the core. All of us come with the, 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 the capability, with the inherent capabilities in its very raw, nascent and fundamental form. Now how far do you realize your potential and how, to, how far are you actually uh, working in converting your nascent uh, raw capabilities into developed, uh, actualized capabilities? That's a human choice. Followed by human and social problems. Uh, guy, you know, it's, it's based on a basic fundamental uh, dictum that, uh, uh, that, that uh, research should be driven by the values uh, rather than uh, you know, uh, anything else. So, and finally it says that objective of psychology is to understand and explain rather than 
to predict and control. So those are the four principles, uh, principle of subjective views, forming opinions about oneself and the others. Second, the human choice, that is actualizing oneself to its potential capabilities. Third, uh, the human and social problems, that is the research should be driven uh, in the interest of understanding the human problems and the social problems than anything else. And fourth, the objective of psychology and the research uh, uh, in, in psychology should be to, to understand and explain and not to predict and control uh, the, the uh, scenarios and the people. So that's, that's uh, the four postulates or principles of humanistic approach. Um, okay, before we move in, um, please answer the question. Okay, that's, that's again one of the interesting theories wherein Carl Rogers had uh, explained as to what is an individual engaged in throughout the life. So there are two, he explains his theory with the help of these two circles that you see, that is ideal self. Ideal self is, is a circle that describes as to what is it that I want to see myself as. I want to see myself as patient, kind, calm, hardworking, clear, goal-oriented. But am I that? No. The reality that is a perceived self, how I actually look at myself now, I'm not patient yet. I'm sometimes rude. I'm agitated, lazy, clueless and goalless. So my job is to make these circles concentric. That is my goal or, or an individual's goal, lifetime goal should be to, to ensure that ideal self is equal to perceived self. There may be some in the middle as you see the blue area where I want to be confident, I find myself confident. Want to be optimistic? I am optimistic. I want to be of strong resolve? I am of strong resolve. So that's the extent of overlap. That's the ex extent of common zone between ideal self and perceived self. That is the actual self. Rest is yet to be matched. And the whole life is about pushing the perceived self towards the ideal self through practice, through realizations, through hard work, through taking, making good decisions, rational decisions, and then moving ahead in the direction of that decision in, in an effort to, to bring in congruence, similarity, the sameness between the ideal self circle and the perceived self circle. That was a theory by uh, Carl Rogers uh, called as the theory of self-concept. Okay, finally, um, Abraham Maslow uh, had, had uh, suggested his theory, which comprises, <coughs> which, so he said the human's tendency to growth and progress can be represented in a hierarchical fashion, which starts with physiological needs. Physiological needs as are, are those very basic fundamental needs to ensure the livelihood, namely breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep, etc., right? Likewise, once these needs are fulfilled, we, on the hierarchy, we are now interested in the next level needs, safety and security, right? That, that comprise health, employment, property, family, social ability. Once those are fulfilled, one is now striving harder to, uh, to secure the love and belongingness, friendship, family, intimacy, sense of connection. Those fulfilled, we now try to climb the next ladder, next step on the ladder, self-esteem. Now I'm, I'm bothered also about my significance, my importance, my identity in the society. So confidence, achievement, respect of others. And after fulfillment of these, the ultimate, uh, ultimate culmination of one's, one's progress, one's growth, according to Abraham Maslow, self-actualization, which talks about the high order, higher order, components of, of, of an individual's life, namely morality, creativity, spontaneity, acceptance, experience, purpose, meaning, inner potential, as we just discussed um, about the realization of potential. So that's, that's essentially Abraham Maslow's theory of personality, which is called a theory of the hierarchy of needs, as, as you see on the screen. Okay, so before we conclude, before we close, kindly answer this question 
And that brings us to the close of uh, the chapter, personality. We'll be back with another topic on, uh, in, in, 